The beginning of setting boundaries is figuring out what the solution is, what you want or need. If you're not familiar with setting boundaries and you're frustrated because you work late every night, it seems like the boundary is not working so late. So how do you begin to implement a schedule that better fits the life that you want to have? Looking for a better sleep? Try Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers and get seven forms of magnesium in each capsule. Click the link in the description or pinned comment to save 10%. Nedra, welcome to the podcast. How you doing? I'm well. Thank you for having me. Today, we're going to go deep into boundaries. And as somebody who's written about boundaries, you're an expert in the field. You've talked about how this has actually been something that's been a challenge for you for nearly all your life. And you share the story in your book of when you're in grad school, you went and saw a therapist and this therapist gave you the book Boundaries. So talk about how that was a pivotal moment and how that changed things. Yeah. So my therapist recommended a book called Where You End and I Began. And it's the first time that I ever read about boundaries. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is life-changing information. Why aren't people talking about this? Why isn't this like required reading? And I have a friend and she's like, remember that time that therapist gave you that book and how much you talked about boundaries? Um, So for me, it was life-changing because I didn't know that I was struggling with boundary issues. I thought it was some other issue. And really, It was an issue of saying no and sticking to it, issues around um, allowing people to have a reaction to your boundaries without, you know, trying to change their opinion or forcing them to understand you. I didn't necessarily have a challenge with setting the boundary. My issue was dealing with the reception after I set the boundaries. Okay, so you were able to, you know, Confronts probably the wrong word, but express yourself with the person that you needed to, you know, instill a boundary. But then was it more just when they would, you know, push back, you weren't able to hold strong? Yes, I felt absolutely terrible. (laughs) I felt terrible. And then I would be like, okay, maybe I don't need this boundary anymore. Maybe it's just me, guys. Um... (laughs) And I would either renege on the boundary or I would I would hold the boundary sometimes, but I just felt bad doing it because no one, you know, at least not the unhealthy folks in my circle, they didn't agree with it. They're like, no, you should absolutely give someone your last and you should absolutely help people when you cannot. That's actually healthy. And I was like, really? No. Um, so once I discovered that I actually can't do those things and I shouldn't do those things, it was easier for me to stick to my boundaries. And you can use yourself as an example, but why do you think people struggle so much? Let's let's cuz there are two different parts to boundaries like we've alluded to and you talk about this in your book. We need to state the boundary and then we need to, you know, hold that boundary over time. So, what is it about going through that process? Where do you find, you know, you've worked with patients now for over 14 years. So, where do you find people struggle in that process and over what type of things are most common? Yeah. So I I think that stating the boundary and really honoring your boundary through behavior is tough because we want people to like the boundary. We want to be able to say this really difficult thing and them not have any reaction. We want to be able to say to people, actually, I don't want to come home for the holiday. And they say, okay, great. That's fine. What would you like to do instead? I'm in full support. And that's not typically how it goes. Their feelings are hurt. Um, They have a lot of questions. Sometimes they won't talk to you for a little bit. You know, all sorts of things can happen. Rarely, um, when we say the really hard boundaries are people like, okay, sometimes people will say, okay, depending on the person and depending on the boundary. And so those very challenging boundaries, particularly the ones with family, we avoid saying them because we know that they'll have some weight to them. 
And I think the big thing to keep in mind when you're trying to set boundaries is even if it is a little bit or a lot of discomfort in the the interim, in the long run, you're going to pay the price if you don't express yourself and you're going to suffer a lot more if you just try and push through, you know, year after year, month after month, whatever it is, not expressing your true feelings. Yeah, you definitely suffer when you agree to do things that you really don't want to do. It's like going to a party and not wanting to be there. It's like you're the sourpuss in the corner, like, oh my gosh, why did I come? Um, which, you know, perhaps you shouldn't have went, <laughs> you know, if you didn't if you didn't want to be there. And we have a really hard time with that because the people-pleasing part of us wants to other people to be happy. And sometimes to our own detriment, sometimes to us not feeling our best. And you mentioned the people pleasing part. I know that's a challenge for a lot of people. Is that just a part of our evolution as humans? Why do we care so much about making other people happy? Well, I think that in some ways it's healthy to want the people in our lives to be happy. I know I certainly want everyone to be happy and I want them to be happy with me from time to time. If I buy you a gift, I'd love to see you smile when you open it and be excited to have it. Um, But also I have to know that I'm not always going to get it right with you. And so if you open a gift and you say, oh, I would have loved this in blue instead of purple. I have to accept that. And I have to say, okay, let's get you blue. Um, So often we take that difference of what somebody wants or what someone needs as a critical aspect of who we are, that we can't ever get it right. And it's like, no, they just prefer a different color. Sometimes people have different preferences. Doesn't mean you're a horrible gift giver. Just means that they wanted a different color in this particular thing. And so the people pleaser in us, it, it it's normal and it's healthy to some extent. It, it gets a little troublesome when we are constantly trying to appease people, make them happy, It's not possible. I know of a situation where I had a family member and they were trying to figure out what everybody wanted to eat. And at the end of it, they have four different meals, you know, and so they were, I'm going to, I got to go to all these places. And I'm like, you're going to drive to four different places. I think it would be easier to say, Hey, I'm going to this spot, look at the menu and decide what you want. If someone says, I don't want anything from there, there's always peanut butter and jelly available. There's always some fruit in a bowl available, but you don't have to drive to four places to to appease everyone because that is taxing and the food will be cold. So it's not even a good strategy, but I think in our need to make sure that everybody is getting what they want, we sometimes go too far. And using that example you just gave where somebody is just trying to please everybody and they're going to multiple restaurants, trying to appease to everybody's different uh, palate, it seems like in that situation, correct me if I'm wrong, but they didn't even realize there was a problem there. It sounds like you had to bring that forward so they made that realization. Somebody who has a problem right now with boundaries, how do they go about Unless I guess they go see a therapist. But other than that, how do they go about knowing that this is an issue for them? Mm, Your stress levels. Lots of people are stressed and they have no clue why. But then when they lay out everything that they're doing, it's like, wow, that's that's a lot. That is a lot. And you have to figure out a way to take some things off your plate, find some some ways to do things easier or just not do them. Those are your options, but you can't do everything. It's just not possible. And so I would say stress is one big way. Um, Sleep issues sometimes is, you know, an indicator that you're stressed or anxious, anxiety, depression, frustration, feeling unappreciated, burnout. All of those things are indicators that boundaries need to be set. Okay, so somebody right now who's listening or watching and they're feeling some of those symptoms and they want to begin to set boundaries, how do they go about doing that if this is a totally new concept to them? 
The beginning of setting boundaries is figuring out what the solution is, what you want or need. If you're not familiar with setting boundaries and you're frustrated because you work late every night, it seems like the boundary is not working so late. So how do you begin to implement a schedule that better fits the life that you want to have? Sometimes we have to work late. You know, I know people in professions like accounting and especially tax, tax folks. And, you know, a certain time of year, you have to work late. But how do you spread that out? How do you prepare for that season? Um, So there are some things we have to do and there are some things we opt to do. Many of us are opting to to do more than we can take on okay let's use the example of of work and you use the accounting example we'll we'll use something else because that could be a special example like Mm -hmm. you mentioned if it's a certain time of year and it's time to you know put in the extra hours Mm -hmm. but what if there's a boss out there we'll just keep it really vague and they have an office job and they're feeling the pressure on a regular basis and what if somebody tries to set a boundary and they're not, you know, being heard, or even if they are being heard, the same situation comes up again and again, and they feel like their boundary is not being met. How do they go about, how do they go about continuing that, you know, that push for that, that healthy boundary in their life? It goes back to stating the boundary and doing the boundary, right? So if you say, I'm not available after 6 p.m. after I've worked from 8 to 5 30 then you can't answer emails you can't answer your phone you literally can't be available because what we do is sometimes we'll state the boundary and we really put it on the other person to uphold the boundary that they don't they didn't one sometimes they don't know about it and two they don't even want you to have it And so we put it on them to uphold this boundary. And really, it's our boundary. It's our work to do. So I have to not check my email. I have to um, also not be engaged um, by phone or, you know, on these different apps with my team. I have to make sure that I am honoring my boundary first. And when I consistently do that, people will understand that I am unavailable. I hear what you're saying there, but what if you start getting pushback and you know you're doing it in a healthy way mm-hmm. and this is just maybe the the system at that place of work where everybody is on Slack 24-7 and available and it's like, no, I've worked here for 10 years and I've been doing that maybe. So everybody has this expectation of me that's built over time, but it's like, I realize this isn't healthy and, and my other teammates aren't accepting of this. Do they have to accept your boundary or do they have to respect it? Because sometimes people won't agree with your boundary. And I would wonder, is your work being done? If you work in a setting where there are some performance goals, are you meeting your goals? Are you available during times that are important? Do they understand that there is um, huge benefits to having some work-life balance and not always being plugged in. Those may not be the values of the people on your team, but they can certainly be your values and you can uphold your values even at work. Let's take that example a little bit further and say you do implement new boundaries. They're accepted at work and say after 5.30 p.m. you're not able to be reached. And that, that forms a healthy relationship with your family at home And it becomes a good thing, but five years down the line, something changes and maybe you need to even tighten that up even more. So maybe it's like 4 p.m. I, I, my kids are getting older. I need to be home when they get done school or whatnot. What I'm getting at with all this is what about changing of boundaries over time? Yes, you you can absolutely change your boundaries just like everything in your life changes. You know, you change your hairstyle, you change jobs, friends, all sorts of things. You can change boundaries because as you grow and evolve, so will your boundaries. And some of them, you know, maybe over time they become less strict. Maybe you said, I'm not available at 5.30 and your kids are out of the house now and you want to work to 9 p.m. I don't know. Like, or maybe you're, you're single now and you do have more time for work. Your boundaries are what you define. And so if you want to change them, you can at any point. It could be, you know, one week later, one year, 10 years, never. 
It's up to you to decide what is working for me right now. What is helping me to live the life that I want to have? What is making me mentally well? And I think it's important we highlight that because it takes a lot of the pressure off of forming new boundaries. If you don't get it right the first time, it might take a little bit of experimenting and testing new boundaries with your lifestyle and seeing how that works. But knowing that we're not fixed on this new way of living forever can take the pressure off. Yes, absolutely. You don't have to have pressure to do anything because you can change your mind. And again, talking to the person who this is totally new for, and obviously these conversations aren't the easiest, whether it be, you know, with a partner in your life, friend or romantic partner, if it's, you know, the boss at work, how do you begin to, or do you ever get comfortable talking about these things that a lot of people just avoid their entire life? Well, you may not get comfortable, but hopefully you get uncomfortable enough to talk about them because sometimes those conversations come up as a result of just being uncomfortable and sitting in that for so long that you can't take it anymore that you decide to change. And I think that that is uh a wonderful space to to start from as well. Like maybe you're not like, oh, yay, boundaries. I get to set some more. But Perhaps that you're so tired of being bothered while on vacation um, with work tasks that you get to a point where you say, they can't bother me anymore. I need to put something in place so they're not contacting me while I'm on vacation at work. So we've talked about work quite a bit, and I mentioned relationships, friendships, romantic relationship. If somebody is feeling those symptoms you talked about earlier, and they realize, you know, this is likely an issue with boundaries, where do they start? Like, what area would you recommend delving into first? Because obviously, we can't go about changing everything overnight. But what area would you say would be a good area to dive into first and and would have the biggest impact? You know, I think the thing causing you the most stress, and that's going to be different for everyone. The thing that's causing you the most frustration, resentment, anxiety, frustration, any of those things, that's the place to start. And for all of us, that could be different. For some of us, it's our romantic partnership. For some of us, it's our kids, some work. So it really depends on what's happening. When I'm working with clients, I usually have them, what are what are the high stress areas? which of those things would change your life if you change that thing? And that's different for everyone. That makes sense. Very individualistic. And let's use a specific example. This is something most of us have probably had happen sometime in our life where a friend, family member, they want some help moving, which is, you know, a fair request. But maybe, you know, you're busy with life at that time and you have your own stresses and it just doesn't work for you. Let's get into the specifics of how to go about setting that boundary, using that example in a healthy way. I'm not able to help you move, but what other way can I support you in this transition? Maybe I can send you a pizza your first night at the new place. Maybe I can help you come over and paint. Perhaps I can sit there while they're delivering your refrigerator, but One thing I won't do is move boxes. I won't, you know, like you can let them know what ways you're able to help. Um, Maybe I'll help you pay for movers. I don't know. But you can let people know um, what works for you. At this phase of life, I am on anyone who is listening. I don't want to help anyone move. I don't want to be liable for damaging anything because I am not a mover. (laughs) So... I'm not trying to chip a piece of wood off your dresser, Um, but I certainly can help you unpack, put things in place, uh, potentially paint. There are lots of things that I can help with. So how do we say to people, I don't want to do this, but I can do this? Okay, so let me play the friend who's trying to convince you to help move. And you you give me a reason that, you know, it's not going to work for you. And then I say, Nedra, but... I don't have any help that day. You're you're one of my good friends. I really need you to help. Why can't you come help me move? And I get a little bit more specific and I start probing at you with the why. I understand that you need someone. Have you considered hiring movers or even asking, you know, a coworker because 
I am not in the best position to help you. And do you ever recommend adding a story to that? What story? <laughs> I don't no, know. No, but you can see how that, that, that yeah, would be a common I, I thing. Yeah, I get that. But I think sometimes the story, it, it doesn't even apply. Like sometimes, you know, I set a boundary recently and I really went over it. It was about, you know, someone visiting my house and... I wanted to create a story and and I couldn't even think of, because what happens sometimes if it's not a legitimate story and the outcome you want is still no, like the outcome I would want in that situation is to not help them move, period. I don't want to create a story where then you go in and say, well, you could just move it to this time and now you can come in. I don't want to help you move. It doesn't matter what the story is. <laughs> like, I could give you a story. Oh, the last time I was moving someone, I, I hit my knee on the thing and it really hurt me. Then they would say, oh, well, your knee is better now. I don't want to help you move. That's it. I just don't want to do it. And sometimes a story can, you know, help ease the no, but there are times when we can give people a story and they will figure out some other reason or a solution, a hole in your story and all of these things. And they will use that to try to get you to say yes to this thing. So I understand that, you know, sometimes a story can be helpful and sometimes a story can um, add more harm to the situation than help. That makes sense. That's all helpful. But what I was actually trying to get to was saying sorry. So as part of your response saying, no, I can't do that. I'm sorry. D is that ever called for? Or is that just, oh, sorry, is that, is that, sorry. yeah, sorry. Okay. Cause you can see how that's probably used by a lot of people to dampen setting a boundary that somebody doesn't want to hear. Is that, is that ever necessary or something you'd advocate for? I wonder why you're apologizing. No, but I'm just, yeah, I, I agree. But I'm picturing like somebody maybe texting you to say, can you help me move on this day? You'd be like, sorry. If there's a friend you might or a family member, you might say, sorry, but I'm busy that day or whatever it is. I mean, if you're, that could be true. Maybe you're making that up. But I could see how somebody would typically or could use that as part of their, their response. I gravitate more towards unapologetic boundaries. Um, I don't, there may be some situations where, you know, saying sorry will um, lessen the blow or make you feel better to take some ownership. But for the most part, I think just saying what the boundary is or I'm, I, I'm not able to help you is enough. I don't know if, when someone's told me no and I really wanted them to do something and them saying sorry, it's like, yeah, but does that mean you're going to do it? You know, like, I'm not sure, like, how the sorry even even helps in some situations. I think we have a habit of saying that because it's one of the ways that we're like, it's kind of like saying, don't be mad at me. It's like, I can't help you. Don't be mad at me. And they can be mad at you. Like people can be upset at you for not helping them move. People can be upset at you for not answering your phone when they wanted to talk to you. They can be upset for any reason. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's just it's just an attempt to soften the blow, but it's not really adding to the to the situation. Yeah, because what they really want you to do, you're unwilling to do it. <laughs> you're like, no, I don't I don't want to do this thing. And it's like, okay, sorry. Oh, are you going to do it? Like, that's what I would wonder. Like, maybe that means that they'll do it now since they feel bad. And what I gather from reading your book and, and chatting with you so far is that we want to keep this as concise as possible. It's not about getting into a debate with the person and, and sharing all kinds of extra details. It's about being clear, being assertive and, and getting to your point. Absolutely. And I think Sometimes we say a lot and we don't really set a boundary. I've seen people say like, and, you know, when I do this thing for you, blah, 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 blah. And they still haven't set a boundary, but they've said a lot of words. <laughs> and so 
I'm like, I, I think that's great. You have a wonderful position. You use a lot of key words there, but you didn't actually set a boundary. That's the part that you miss because you're you're giving like story, detail, story, detail. And it's really important to say to someone, I won't be able to help you with this. If we're thinking about moving and you're telling this person everything you have to do on Saturday, how the last time you helped somebody move, you broke two fingernails, how you really hate helping people move, you still haven't told them no. So you've said a lot of stuff, which people do a lot of. They're, oh my gosh, I really don't like to eat at this place. Da, 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 da. But they never say, I don't want to go to this place. Can we go to blank instead? So it's like, I, I guess you want to go. You just don't like it. <laughs> I can imagine a lot of people too, to soften the blow, might use a not now instead of a clear no. And I can see how that would cause, you know, the same issue to come up again and again, and in the long term, cause a lot more stress than just being clear up front. Even though, again, that would be a little bit easier just to kind of push it along and, and dismiss it off your current plate, but it's just going to come back at you. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, sometimes we will prolong saying no. I find that a lot when you have like gatherings and you send the evite or you send the, the invitation and people won't say no. It's just like in limbo. It's like, hey, it's been three weeks. Are you coming or not? It's like, I'm still trying to do just say no, just say yes, give me an answer. <laughs> you know, like I just want an answer. I'm not upset if you don't come. I just want an answer. And you can only imagine what that would cause mentally thinking about that however many times if you're putting off a decision like an RSVP for a party say you're doing that for two or three weeks, you can only imagine the stress and the the wasted brain cycles that would accumulate doing that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So say we're somebody, again, watching or listening right now, and, and we're an aware parent of this boundary thing. And maybe after we do a little bit of experimentation and start applying it to our own life, we have young kids at home. And say they're they're under 10, Let's be more specific, under five. And we want to, at a young age, start to teach those kids healthy boundaries. What would you say? How can a parent go about doing that in a healthy way? Many kids already um, have some boundaries, and our role is to help them communicate it and to kind of shape them up. So lots of time, kids have very clear, strong preferences. So they're very good at communicating it. And we have to do a good job of receiving it as parents. In terms of boundaries around your physical space, those are things that we might want to teach children. Um, certainly shaping up their language just a little bit because sometimes kids can be a little aggressive. So helping them to lean more towards being assertive and how they communicate those boundaries can be a really helpful skill, but certainly allowing them to have boundaries and in different ways with you know a variety of people in different settings um, is really helpful. I like this one example you gave in the book where a parent might try and coax a child into, say, hugging another family member. And maybe the child is like, no, no, and they're not into it. But I could see how that would be you know, a common response from a parent if it's a family member or a friend of the family to try and get them, no, go and hug this person. This is your, your grandpa or grandma or whatever it is. But I really like the way you put it where letting kids at a young age decide that for themselves. Talk about why that's important. Kids have to determine who's safe because who you find to be safe might not be safe to them. It's okay if you have a great relationship with grandma and your kid doesn't like grandma. It's all based on preference. And kids should be able to decide who they feel comfortable with and who they feel uh, most vulnerable with. And lots of times... The adults are choosing their relationships with people and it really puts them in a position to not know how to choose healthy relationships because at a young age, they're going off energy. I, I love when 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 babies are like, you know, you go to pick a baby up and the baby is screaming. It's like, oh, well, and the mom is like, she only wants me. That's great. That's healthy. I am a stranger. <laughs> like, 
like your baby actually shouldn't like me. Like, I don't smell like you. I don't look like you. Your baby is going with the person that they feel comfortable with. And that's healthy. That is a beautiful sign of attachment. That's I'm not offended by that. I thought the baby was cute. Thought I could pick him up. Nope, I can't. And that is okay. I will go on in life. Um, but that's not a bad thing. That just means that that baby wants to be with someone that they are familiar with. And they're not always familiar with grandma and auntie and cousin so and so, especially if there is not consistent communication and, you know, these sorts of things where we put kids in these situations, hug my coworker. It's like, I don't know them. Um, We have to be very mindful that we are essentially saying, hug a stranger. Um, And it, it feels very awkward to them. And kids typically warm up to people once they can feel them out, once they can understand like, okay, this person is safe. And sometimes kids are reacting to prior experiences with that person or with someone who looks like them, right? So, you know, if 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 Grandia yelled at them two weeks ago and now you're like, hug them, they're like, oh no, not that guy, you know? And so how do we just allow them to honor their space? If they want to hug you, they will hug you. And if they do not want to, please don't take it personally. It could be, they're just warming up. They're getting to know you and we have to allow them to do that and not force even children to have relationships with people that they don't want to have relationships with. I'm sure that makes sense for anybody listening, but what about the other person in that interaction, the grandparent or, or the friend, and they just, you know, they haven't listened to this and they don't see the other side necessarily. Is it just that we can't worry about the way other people respond or how do we, how do we lighten that blow that somebody else who isn't aware of this might feel? Well, I'm a huge proponent of you do not like have to like everyone. You just don't. And I think we now live in a society that says you have to like everyone. You have to like everybody in your class. You have to be friends with everyone. And really who we like and who we don't like is based on our preferences, our connections to this person. Sometimes with family, it's how often they see them. Um, So there are so many factors there that will help them to like or not like a person. But ultimately, I wonder if they know something that you don't know. Maybe they have some energy there that you don't sense because you're an adult. And it's not to say it's a bad energy, but it could be, you know, this person squeezes me tight when they hold me. Like, I don't know. And we don't know. And so we're putting them in these situations where they may not have the language or, you know, the the ways to communicate that they are uncomfortable in these situations. And so just the crying, the pushing back, the saying no and shaking their head, that may be an indicator that they're not ready. And for an adult who's, you know, really taking this on and starting to implement some serious boundaries. But say we'll use the example, their romantic partner has been with them for 10 years and they've, they're not used to them behaving in this way. How can we go about, or should we, I guess, go about softening that? Because for a lot of people, this is going to be a 180 and people in our lives aren't necessarily going to know how to react to it. Do we worry about that at all or do we just do we just go for it? Yeah. Um we can't control their reactions. I mean we can deal with the discomfort of how they react, but we certainly can't control it. We can't make them understand it in a different way or like this really hard thing that we've said. Um it would be great if they just said, Okay, cool, your kid doesn't want to hug me, but and I don't know. I, I wrote the book on boundaries, so I'm I'm fine when kids are kind of standoffish or they don't want to, you know, show me some affection or something because I don't know them. <laughs> if it's someone that I have a regular relationship with, those kids tend to come to me and, you know, initiate a hug. They tend to, hey, auntie, 
you know, like I have worked to build those relationships to the point that they trust me to be um, a loving force in their life. So I think that's really important that we make sure we're trying to get to know people without um, getting in their space first. And I can imagine a lot of times, especially in the beginning for somebody trying to implement new boundaries, they may slip up and say they're out having tea with a friend and the friend is like, okay, I'm moving in two weeks. We'll come back to the moving example again. And maybe right away, you don't know how to react to that. And you say yes, just because you're put on the spot. What are your thoughts on that? Like, can you, would you recommend if somebody's working on this to go back and, and, and say it differently afterwards or just try and learn from that situation? Or are there things that we'd be doing beforehand to be ready for those kind of things? Because I can see how, again, in the beginning, that could easily happen. Well, this is not a standardized test, so you can change your answer. <laughs> you haven't submitted the answer. No one has your uh, scorecard or anything. You can change the answer. You could call them back a week later and say, you know, when I said yes to that, I really wasn't thinking about the other things that I had on my plate. And now I want to change my mind. And let's talk about the dynamic when, say, somebody's implemented a new boundary where a partner wants to make sure they're both at home by 5.30 eating dinner together every night. And they go about implementing that for a period of time. It's going well, but they get lax about it and their partner starts coming home late and maybe this happens a few times. Do you find that it's all or nothing when it comes to this stuff or taking a step back like that? Does that really restart everything or is it already the foundation there? Mm, you have to restate the boundary because with everything that we try to implement, it's practice. And sometimes when you're practicing something, you fall off. You could, you know, be very good at doing something for five days and then that sixth day you forget to do that thing. That doesn't mean all is lost. It means on day seven you have to pick it back up. So it's really important to make sure that you are reminding people, this is what we said, this is what we did, um, and not necessarily thinking all is lost because I tried to do this one thing and they forgot about it four days in a row. We could never do it again. Start over. We're not perfect. Absolutely. And Nedra, up until this point, we've talked a lot about or actually exclusively about boundaries between different people, but also in the book, you talk about boundaries to oneself. And I really like the example you gave, and this is a good one. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to, and that is finances. And you used an example of, of somebody in your book who was paycheck to paycheck and got some kind of bonus. And then he went and bought like a new car. Let's talk about the importance of this, because this is a whole area that, is maybe arguably more important being having boundaries, healthy boundaries with ourselves. Absolutely. Um, I spoke to that earlier when I said not answering the work emails, not answering the phone once you set the boundary that, you know, there are a lot of things outside of our control, but what we do is typically within our control. And so I've seen it where people have a lifestyle that they certainly could afford, but they're they're living outside of what they can afford. And so they're purchasing things. And so in therapy, we do talk about that. We talk about uh, just some financial boundaries to have with yourself. A budget is a boundary, uh, you know, not using your bonus to buy more things that you don't need or to treat treat people um, to excessive gifts and these sorts of things. Like how do you need to use this money in a way that could be beneficial to you and your family? And finances aside, when it comes to setting personal boundaries, what other areas do we have to look at? All of them. I mean, <laughs> social media, um, our relationships with people, our physical health, our mental health, um, everything is 
can be a personal boundary. Like what are, what do you want in this situation? What time you wake up in the morning? What time you go to bed? How much you drink when you go out with your friends? All of those things are personal boundaries. And I think so often we attribute these things to things that are outside of our control when in actuality, these are things that we have some ability to, to monitor. Speaking of social media, I'd love for you to share the story of of being, we'll say a lay person on Instagram, having around 2000 followers. And then all of a sudden, the New York Times shares a post that involves you. And, and I know now you have over a million followers. So talk about that evolution, and how you've had to go about forming healthy boundaries when it comes to your social media. Yeah, so that evolution was a beautiful unfolding, but certainly in some ways um, shocking, just the rapid growth of it all. Prior to, I say 2017, I was not an avid social media user. I didn't have Facebook. I didn't have Twitter. Um, I had Instagram personally, but I probably posted very infrequently. I didn't even have an app on my phone. And One day, our office assistant at my group practice, she was posting things on um, our Kaleidoscope counseling page. And it was, it was like, you know, quotes from like Instagram, this sort of thing. And I had never looked at it. I had never even looked at our page. I just knew she was posting this stuff. And one day I looked at it and I said, I think I could post something better than that. And it was like July 1st. And I was just like, I want to start posting our content for social media. And I started and maybe, you know, a year and a half later, I had 2000 followers. And it seems like once I got to about 2000, you know, a few months later, I had 10 and probably three months later, I had like 100,000. And then I was in the New York Times. And from there, you know, two years later, I'm at a million. And it has been a really great experience because my um, reservations about social media is that it was this dark place where people just get into all of this trouble. And really what I'm finding is it is what you create. It is what you um, curate it to be. And I've created a space that feels good for me. I don't follow a ton of stuff. Sometimes I do search things. I like, I do use, you know, the, the search as a Google of sorts. So I'll say, you know, Hey, put in someone's name and I'll look at their, their page or that sort of thing. But I don't follow a lot of stuff. Really. I like to spend my time there creating and curating content, um, and connecting and, I find it to be a really great space. Um, I don't really use it personally anymore. Like I don't, I don't use it. I I wasn't using it anyway. I'm like, I'm more of a text me a picture of your kids. Send me a photo of your vacation versus let me go on Instagram and and see. It's just, I I like the, you know, the intimate connection um, with people. And so that just hasn't been my my thing. And it it really still isn't, but I love to look at the wellness pieces there. I do like, you know, some aspects of the, the entertainment portion, you know, you get a little bit of news there. So I think it's a, it's a wonderful space that you can curate. If you want to keep up with your family and friends, you can do that too. And I think we have to um, be mindful about what sort of energy pools we're allowing it to have. And based on what's happening, we have to utilize the features available. Unfollow, block, delete, restrict, mute. There are so many things we can do in that space to really make it reflective of the experience we want to have. So going from that 2,000 followers to now over a million, how many year period was that? Two. (laughs) <laughs> wow. So relatively quick. How did that go about changing things? Because you had been a practicing therapist for a lot of years to that point. Now you have your book out on boundaries and it was a New York Times bestseller and, and you have this this public figure, enormous Instagram account. 
So how has that changed your day to day? Like, are you working a lot with patients? Are you working with less now? Talk about the evolution there. Yeah. So I am working with less, less clients, but still working with clients. I, you know, I feel like that is the source, the source of energy for me to be able to do all these other things. I really love the work of being a therapist and helping people um, figure out these things. And I, it, it makes me a better student. It makes me a better um, creator. It makes me a better writer. Um, and I really like to do it. So that piece of it, I am still very into. And I see clients, you know, two days a week. And then the other days I'm doing podcasts and writing and, you know, creating and that sort of thing. So I've, I've, you know, I've only actually cut back like one day. I went from like three to two. Um, but I really like that piece of stuff. So I could see me, you know, in that space long term. And, you know, if I, if I need to cut back for some reason, I would, or if I need to cut something else out, but I like to do all of the things that I'm currently doing. So I believe in creating space for those and just figuring out how to make them fit. Is another book in the works? Yes. That's exciting. When can we expect to see that? Um, well, um, soon. How about that? Soon. Um, okay. Maybe we can talk again when it comes out. I'm curious. You're leaving a lot to the imagination there, which is okay. I am leaving a lot to the imagination. Um, Set Boundaries, Find Peace did so well that it just opened so many opportunities. I mean, you always want your book to do well. And when it does, it's like, oh, wow, I, I wasn't thinking this. Um, so it's it's been a wonderful journey and it has created a lot of opportunities even with writing. So I will be seeing myself as a writer. Um I meant you said book, I would say books with a s. Um that I like this space of being able to to help people therapeutically without seeing them as a client because that's how I learned a lot about, you know, myself, personal development, about finances, about whatever I wanted to in life. It was through reading a book. And so to be able to help someone by having this information available to them is just amazing. I talked about the book that changed my life at the top of this um, podcast. So to have a book where people are saying, oh my gosh, this is just amazing. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is this is great. And this is long term. You know, we live with books, a book, you know, two of my favorite books were written before I was born. <laughs> so, you know, books are one of those things that they are amazing long term. What are the two books? Uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. And I love the autobiography of Malcolm X. Those are two books that I revisit often. Um and there, I mean, I just, I, I just finished reading Their Eyes Were Watching God for like the sixth time. Like, I just like to read the book. It's such a good book. Um, and every time I read it, I get something different. And I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, was this book like written in the 1930s, 1940s? Like what? It, but it's the information, I mean, change the context. And it's so much of what we experience in life. No, we're not in the Florida Everglades and, you know, like all of this stuff. But the human experience is so much the same that it's just like, oh, my gosh, like change a few words, throw in some slang here. We have modern times. And I think that's an important thing for all of us to realize the commonality of the human experience. There's something powerful in that. And I'm sure as a therapist, you would agree upon that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, books are just a beautiful way to do, to do the work in and out of therapy. If you never go to a therapist, there are books that you could read that could be hugely beneficial and life-changing. I used to read books that I hadn't even been through some of the things that I was reading about, but I knew that at some point in life I would experience this and I just wanted the tools before I needed them. And it was just really helpful because I knew how to handle certain situations like 
a, a breakup, like a serious adult breakup. When I was in high school, I read a book about one and I was like, oh, doesn't apply to me. But when I had that first serious breakup, I was like, oh, this is normal. Like this is <laughs> like, I'm not losing it. Like it just felt really good to have that information. So books are so important. How early was it that you got involved in personal development? It sounds like at a quite young age. And what is it about you that drew you in? Um, I would say I've always loved reading books. I've always loved reading books. Um, Scholastic, they used to sell the books at school and I just loved it. I would say in high school, I started to read more and try to understand myself, people in my life and just the world around me because I didn't have, um, I mean, none of us do, you know, we don't know everything, but I knew that there had to be some deeper meaning to things, to people. And I want, I, wanted to understand them. I've loved talking to people and understanding their story. So if I could relate it to something I've learned in a book or read in a book or conversation I've had, it just helps me to understand how people become who they are or how they evolve or how they fall into certain circumstances. Like just having that information was so helpful. And at that you know, maybe that was the beginning of me sort of becoming a therapist, like learning about all of these things and how these things really connect us as people. And how old were you when you knew that was the route you're going to take and become a therapist? Um, you know, I would say I didn't know that was the route I was going to take until I became a therapist. <laughs> because before then, it was a lot of exploring. It was a lot of exploring. I didn't, you know, I wasn't like five years old. Like, I want to be a therapist. I'm like, I, I don't know. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a judge. I want to be this. I want to be that. But when I had my first client at an internship and the way that the session went and the connection that we had, that's when I knew, like, this is what I want to do forever. Um, prior to that moment, I thought that's what I wanted to do, but I thought I wanted to do other things and I tried those, but that was the thing where I was like, okay, this is it. I could quit all that other stuff. <laughs> and the interesting thing is you're continuing to evolve and you, I'm sure will continue to evolve. I have a story of, you know, going to school and becoming a chiropractor. And now the podcasting thing has become what I do for a living. It's like, in your example as well, you could have never predicted you'd become a public you know, influencer the way you are and where you are with everything you're doing right now. So it's exciting to look at life that way where, you know, following what you love and, and giving it your all, it's, it's a fun ride. Absolutely. And I think that when we give ourselves the opportunity to just live, we can learn a lot about life. I know that for so many young people, it is this pressure to figure out what you want to do when you grow up, who you want to be. And that changes. That changes over time. You know, I thought I wanted to be an FBI agent. I thought I wanted to work in retail. I thought that I wanted to be a judge. I thought, you know, like all of these things, right? And when you're just living and you try a little bit of something, you have one criminal justice class, it's like, nope, don't want to do that. You know, <laughs> or, you, or you try these things, you really figure out like, no, this is not for me. This is not for me. And when you get to a space where something feels natural, then it's like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And that could happen at any point. It could happen at 12. It could happen at 20, 40, 60. When I was in grad school, I mean, I went to a commuter school. Um, so, you know, people were older. It was an older age group. And in grad school, you know, we had students who were retiring from places, legitimate. I've worked there 25 years and now I want to become a social worker. So that's not what they set out to do, but that's what they wanted to become in this second, you know, in this second career. And so it's really important to give yourself the opportunity to become whatever, you know, that thing is. And sometimes it's exactly what we planned. And sometimes it's just what we, you know, sort of fell into. And I feel like 
um, with Instagram, just like by creating content, which a lot of it is just me clearing my head of a lot of things that I'm thinking about, a lot of things that um, may come up for people therapeutically. Uh, my reaction to things I'm listening to or watching or conversations I'm having. This is, you know, this is the majority of, you know, where the creation come from. And just doing that, it has created a whole new job for me. And I'm like, oh, no, no I didn't want to grow up being an you know, a, a person on Instagram with a million followers. That wasn't even an option. Instagram wasn't even available. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing, but look what has happened. Well, I think there's two important things to highlight from what you just said. And I a hundred percent agree with all of that. One being we're going to potentially change over a lifetime and, and we might uproot and, and go a different direction. And two, out of our control, the world continues to change. Going back to the Instagram thing, like that never would have been a possibility for you. And and if it weren't for the internet and, and the current technology, I wouldn't be able to do this show. You know, back 20 years ago, it would have been like start at the bottom in radio and work your way up. And we're just in this world that's changing at such a rapid rate. So there's two, I just want to highlight the two aspects. We can change and the world is changing. And together, that forms this dynamic balance and evolution that we all can experience. Yeah, maybe maybe who you want to be isn't available yet. I think about um, there are a lot of folks on Instagram, 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds, and they're like creating this great content. They weren't thinking about doing that. Like that was not even Instagram, but TikTok. You know, there's this, you know, there's this woman on there. She does all the dances and she has a very uh, popular TikTok account. That's not what she wanted to do when she retired. It's just something that sort of happened that she is now stepping into. So, you know, perhaps what you want to do hasn't been created yet. And I think part of the real challenge with that is being patient Mm. because, you know, some of these things more often than not can take a long time and you need to be patient and you need to be focused. What do you think about that? Absolutely. Um, Yeah. Being patient. That's the tough part. The being of patient. (laughs) It's, it's tough, but it's certainly possible and it pays off. All right, Nedra, other than getting a copy of set boundaries, find peace. How can the listeners connect with you after the show? Yes. So I am most present on Instagram. um, And that's where I put everything that I have going on. So please check me out there. All right. Going to link it up in the show notes and excited about the upcoming book or books. And hopefully we can do this again sometime. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you.